as we return to our study in the book of Zephaniah, we're going to look at, at what, what has been presented for us at this time. We need our Heavenly Father's guidance. Now more than ever. We need his, his wisdom. But we also need patience so that we may understand more clearly and more directly that which we are seeing that is going on around us and that which was written aforetimes <clears throat> so that we may more clearly understand that which we are to do at this time. Shall we seek his direction? Shall we seek his blessing as we open his words today? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you on this Sabbath day and we thank you for the many blessings that you have provided. Mm -hmm. We thank you for the words of your prophets, for the direction and the guidance that have been given in years past. Help us now, Father. May our minds be open. May, be, may they be ready to receive your word. We have great need of you. It is only through our understanding of these words, of these warnings, that we may come into a closer relationship with you. We need truly to eat your flesh and drink your blood as your son has given to us. That this and in this manner, we may become your children and may become guided by you, standing under the banner of Prince Emmanuel. We ask, Father, today that your angels may attend us. We ask today for the blessing of your Holy Spirit that our minds may be enlightened. We have sinned, Father. We lay ourselves at your feet. We lay all that we are at your feet. Do with us as you need so that we may be the men and women that would give this message that you have waited so long to give to this world. Direct us now, be with us in all that you would have us to do. For this we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to have a little bit of a recap from last week. But there are going to be some questions that we're going to be asking. The one question that is going to be overriding. There is a passage that was written that tells us that the words and the admonitions of the prophets are written more for what? Our time for theirs. <clears throat> Amen. It is written more for our time than for theirs. Two words. Pay attention. With what we're going to be reading, I want your input. I want to see what you have learned as we are going through these admonitions at this time. So, be aware. Disappointments you will have, but ever bear in mind that Jesus, the living, the risen Savior, 
is your redeemer, your restorer. He loves you. And it is better to share his love than to sit with princes and be separated from him. To be ranked with those whose gold cannot be counted and yet be poor in the estimate of God and the heavenly angels would be eternal loss. In the converted soul, the love of God supersedes the love of the world. The life of faith is a life of peace and rest and joy in the Holy Spirit. How important is faith? Consider that each day. Light, precious light is shining forth from the cross of Calvary. This is our illumination. This is our central light. Look at the cross and accept Jesus by living faith as our what? Righteousness. And power will be with you, for you will prevail with God as did Jacob. What kind of a promise is this? Salvational. It is more than salvational, is it not, brother? Yes. Here, here we are. We are told to look at the cross and accept Jesus by living faith as our righteousness. Righteousness by faith in Christ alone. And the promise is given that power will be with us and that we will prevail as did God with Jacob. Did Jacob struggle with God? Oh, yeah. Was he not accounted righteous because of that struggle? Is this not our It, it, it would seem so. Is this not our privilege for today? I'd have to say yes. Okay. Work for the salvation of souls as though you knew by sight that you were in full view of the whole universe of heaven. Every angel in glory is interested in the work being done for the salvation of souls. We are not awake as we should be. All the angelic host are, are our helpers. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee, think of that, is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Oh, cannot we then work with courage and faith? In that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, fear thee not, and to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. Zephaniah 3, 17 and 16. Only have faith, pray and believe, and ye shall see the salvation of God. Does this sentence tell us that if we pray and believe, we shall become righteous by our faith? Yes. Okay. So how important then is righteousness by faith? Critical. Exactly. It is salvational. It is critical. It is. Our faith in Christ and the righteousness that he offers is eternal for us.
The Lord says to those living in 1897, as he said to those of Israel who had chosen to serve him, I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord. The Lord has given us Jesus, our Savior, to reveal the character and humanity that he wishes each of us to reveal. The Lord's purpose concerning his people is, I have given them minds to understand and to know me. I will increase my grace unto them. Will those who have backslidden return, return unto the Lord, return let there be no delay. In that day shall it be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. The Lord God in the midst of thee is mighty, and he will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Again, Zephaniah 3, 16, 17. What are you seeing in this paragraph that we have just read? What stands out to you? Oh, the Lord's purpose concerning his people is I have given them minds to understand and know me. I will increase my grace unto them. Those things, that, like, stands out to me the most. Okay. <clears throat> what else is there, brothers and sisters? Anyone else have a thought? I see three returns. So it's like a three-step returning process. Agreed. Excellent. Now, is there Good anything catch. else? Is there anything else, brothers and sisters? Well, he's not slack in his promises. I agree. I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord. Draw closer, brothers and sisters. What were the two words I said at the outset of today's presentation? I said, agreed. Pay attention. One of the things that Brother Theodore has been excellent in showing us that Brother Stephen has been incredible at showing us. And I, I will agree with this from the chat that says the Lord gave us Jesus Christ to reveal his character and humanity so that they may be masked manifest in us also i agree but draw closer what are the things that brother theodore brother stephen brother odilio all of these have brought out and brought out so very clearly As we said at the very beginning, <clears throat> prophets wrote more for what? For our time. Than they did for theirs, right? Right. When was this document and when when was this document written? Uh eighteen ninety seven. What year is, is this year? 2023 how many years have transpired since this is written 
uh, 26, uh, 100, um, 126 years. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is a fractal of what? Mm, uh, well, well the if you're talking about the 1260 20. or the 2520, both of those. Are these not warnings for us today, brothers and sisters? Oh, yeah. How much of a warning is this for us today, brothers and sisters? Well, it's a little bit more clear warning than it was yesterday. Now, Elder Jeff was very good also at bringing out a lot of symbols. One of the symbols that, that he used repeatedly as he came to understand it was that of the number 81. Ellen White was 81 when she attended her last general conference session, was she not? Yes, she was. And what did she have to say about that general conference session? It, it was not good things, that's for sure. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe Elder Jeff applied 81 as being another symbol of midnight. I'm checking. Okay. Is midnight a warning to us? Uh, well, yeah. Now, if you were to reverse the numbers of 81, you would come up with the number 18. Right. Now, does 18 mean anything to us? I got a question mark in front of it. Okay. It's Revelation 18. Right. And as noted in the in the chat, 18 is six plus six plus six. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask you this question. Is 18 a fractal of 180? Is yeah. eight. It could definitely be a symbol for it. Okay. As we've just established, this year is 2023, right? Right. What transpired 180 years ago? Boy, I got to tell you the this math stuff. <laughs> Did not the closing of the 1335 occur in 1843, 180 years ago? Yeah, it's 1843 for sure. Because from 508 A.D. to 1843, we have this warning given us in the book of Daniel. Blessed mm -hmm. is he that comes to the 1335. Correct? Right. Do we not have that on the 1843 chart? Is this not a foundational truth for us today? Yes. This warning of what the Lord says to those living in 1897 is now a warning to those living today in 2023. 
How personal is this warning for each of us right now? Well, it should be very personal. We have a double sign here, brothers and sisters. This is not prophecy. This is recognizing the time in which we are living. This is not saying that this will be some great future event. We're looking at the history. We are living in the time 126 years after Sister White gave this warning. We are now living in the time 180 years after the close of the 1335. When the 1335 closed, what followed it? What followed 1843? Opening of judgment. Exactly. We are living in a time where we need to be aware. We need to be careful of what we are doing. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day. How many of the commandments are we to do? All. Please note, this is the following paragraph to what she wrote in 1897. So this is the paragraph that we are to follow today. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day. And the Lord will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land, for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law. And if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, for this is the commandment which I command thee this day. It is not hidden from thee, Neither is it afar off. It is not in heaven that thou should say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou should say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very night unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. Deuteronomy 30, 8 to 14. Yeah, it should be very nigh unto thee. Nigh, okay. I would agree. Yeah, I was trying to figure out what that was. So, transcription error. And I made the error in reading it. You're right, I should have picked up on that. 126 years after she gave this warning. We are now reading this to understand it. After Moses has brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, did have we not established through the, the fine work of Brother Stephen that that occurred in 1533? B.C. Is that not when yes. it is? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. 1533. Three. If we scramble it a different way, brings us again to 1335. We are standing and being prepared 
to come away from the teachings of the world, to be prepared to do all of God's commandments, to be blessed as those that were promised in Leviticus 26, because we are turning away from the curses. We are looking to be benefited by the blessings. The only way that this is going to happen is if we are willing to do all of his commandments. Thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness will be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hands from doing any evil. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high plains of the earth, and feed them with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Isaiah 56, 1 and 2, 58, 13 and 14. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thine hands be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save thee. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Zephaniah 3, 16 and 17. Repeated again in 1898. You can see that the greatest interest upon this earth are the people of the Lord, his church. Is this referring strictly to the corporate church? I'd have to say no. I would say no. I would agree. The people that are willing to keep the commandments of the Lord are his church. It is not an edifice. It is not a structure. It is not a corporation. It is those that have chosen to accept his word, his promises, his commandments just as they are written your only dependence is in the lord that which others have done or may do you have not to answer for you are only answerable for that which in this case we put our names I am only answerable for what, for that which Dwight Howard does. Theodore is only answerable for that which Theodore Turner does. Others are answerable only for what they do. If we spend our time helping to carry one another's burdens. We are answerable for that. But if we are spending our time tearing apart others, casting them out, calling them a Judas, those are answerable for those actions. 
May that not be said of us. May we be willing to carry one another's burdens, to help lift up others, to help them grow in faith. The word of the Lord in Zephaniah is positive. He delights to hear and answer the prayer that comes from the contrite heart. His word is given to us as his pledge. And it shall come to pass that before they call, before the longing desire of the soul is put into the form of a petition, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Isaiah 65, 24. The Lord declares by his prophet that he is to publish to the world the readiness of God's acceptance of his servant's desire before the petition is placed in words. The moment he steadfastly purposes to offer the prayer, the yearning of his soul is respected. Before we even ask, God is ready to answer the prayer. How amazing is that? When Christ's ambassadors present the gospel in its simplicity and the hearers respond to the word presented, nothing is more gratifying to the heart of infinite love than for these souls to come to him confessing their sins and giving expression to their faith. He delights to impart to them his righteousness. Righteousness by faith alone. And angels rejoice when they see hearts opened to receive the communication of light and pardon and love. When thanksgiving arises from human hearts, heavenly beings take up the song of praise. The prophet Zephaniah represents the joy of Christ over the salvation of a lost soul. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Zephaniah 3, 17. Mrs. White repeated this over and over again. And will not the soul redeemed re render his tribute of love and homage? Yes, verily. With the psalmist he will sing, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me, and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. Where else do we find miry clay being described? Is it not in Daniel 2? Was Daniel not brought out of a horrible pit? Many of us, in the ways that we have lived our lives, have found ourselves in a horrible pit. One that we can't extract ourselves from. Yet Christ is willing to bring us out of that type of a pit. I know in my life that there have been times that I have found myself in just that type of a pit. Where I have experienced that Christ is showing his, not only his willingness, but his ability to bring us out of that pit. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh 
the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, <clears throat> nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works, which thou hast done, and thy thoughts, which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Psalm 40, 1 to 5. Zephaniah three eighteen, I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Behold, at that time I will undo all that afflicted thee, and I will save her that halteth, and gather her that was driven out. And I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. The promise in the alternate reading is that we are to behold at that time I will undo all that afflicted thee, and I will save her that halteth, and gather her that was driven out, and I will set them for a praise and fame in every land of their shame. I will lift them up. When we are seeing this in this book of Zephaniah, when it is said that I will save her that halteth, is this not his people, his church, that speaks with stumbling tongue, that halts, that, that doesn't always walk well, and has not the church of God in many ways and in many places been driven out from communion with other brothers and sisters? Did we not see this in 2012 in Newport? 10 years ago, 11 years ago now. Have we not seen many times over these charts, over these tables that were ordained by the hand of God the people were being cast out from fellowship with others. And is God not promising here that he will lift these up? That they will be set for a praise and for fame in every land of their shame. At that time, I will bring you again, even in the time that I gather you. For I will make you a name and a praise among all the people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. The highest, who was with the Father before the world was, submitted to humiliation. He clothed his divinity with humanity that he might lift up the lowly. Prophecy lifts the veil that may behold the throne of heaven, that we may see upon the throne high and lifted up. How important is prophecy for us today? For what does it do for us? I don't need prophecy. All I need is the love of Christ. Prophecy lifts the veil that we may behold the throne of heaven, that we may see upon that throne high and lifted up. When we set aside prophecy, when we look to make prophecy of none effect, Are we not 
forfeiting our title to heaven? One who in human form came to our world to suffer, to be lacerated with stripes and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He proclaims himself the advocate of the sinful human family. Before all the universe of heaven, the Lord of glory suffered in human form that his love as a mighty helper might flow in rich currents to all suffering human beings. He cried out in his agony. He poured out his life on the cross for the one lost sheep. And all heaven is enlisted in beseeching Christ's laborers to recover the guilty sheep that was lost. The lost sheep must be recovered. All the resources of heaven are at the command of the interested worker, that they may bestow upon them perishing souls. The word declares that the Father has given all heaven in the greatest gift of his Son to seek and save that which was lost. The gift has been given, yet how many are willing to truly accept it? What was the words of the Savior? If you love me, how does that finish? Keep my commandments. If you love me. Keep my commandments. How many are there today that are so vocal at professing their love of Christ, but refuse to keep his commandments? Well, aren't they refusing to do what he says? In Many different ways. Yes. Agreed. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, Let not thine hands be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save thee. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the, for the solemn assembly who are of thee, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Behold, at that time, I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that halteth and gather her that was driven out. And I will get them fame and praise in every land where they have been put to shame. At that time, will I bring you again, even in the time that I gather you. For I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth. When I turn back your captivity before the eyes, saith the Lord. Again, Zephaniah 3, 16 to 20. The cross, the cross. It is set up that we may understand and know the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. It tells us of the depth and breadth of infinite love, the greatness of the Father's love. It reveals the astonishing truth that God the Father give, gave himself in his Son, that he might have the joy of receiving back the sheep that was lost. And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people, as he hath promised thee, and that thou shouldst keep all his commandments, and to make thee high above all nations which he has made, in praise and in name and in honor. 
and that thou mayest be a holy people unto the Lord thy God as he has spoken. Deuteronomy 26, 18 and 19. When God makes a people high above all nations, note well that he does so in praise, in name, and in honor. And that which thou mayest be a holy people unto the Lord thy God, as he has spoken. Here again, three steps with a fourth. Does this not prefigure Revelation 14 and Revelation 18? God accepts us that in true praise, we may glorify his wisdom and his majesty in a world of apostasy and idolatry. How many were there that were saved on the ark? Eight. Out of untold millions and possibly billions of people that were on the earth at that time. Please read Zephaniah 3, 14 to 20. The Lord will have his people stand true to his honor and carefully guard the interests of one another. If we are choosing not to guard the interests of other brothers and sisters, are we among the people of God? I'm sorry, a question again, please. If we are not willing to guard the interest of other brothers and sisters, are we then among the people of God? Are we then standing true to the honor of God's character? We are not. Amen. It is incumbent upon us, brothers and sisters, that we carefully guard the interests of one another. It is incumbent upon us <clears throat> to stand and to do so because to do less is to honor the adversary and not to honor our father. Whose banner will you choose to stand under? Who will you choose to glorify this day? All ye are brethren, Matthew 23, 8. The Lord has entrusted money and advantages to his stewards that they may guard the interests of one another, that there may be a continual praise to God, and that there may be unity among his covenant-keeping people, that they may be a praise in the earth, a people that God can bless with still greater advantages, both temporal and spiritual, thus honoring them above the transgressors of his law. God employs his people to do his sacred work in the earth, to be his hand of ministration in imparting these blessings and gifts to one another. If we are not willing to guard the interests of one another, we are not showing continual praise to God. When we are not unified, we are not able to show the praise of God in the earth. God is then unable to bless us. The whole gospel from Genesis to Revelation is the means appointed and specified of God through which to reveal his will to the people, and it is to be appreciated, respected, and heeded. Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has 
come. These words can be found in different manners in all of the books of the Bible. Human agencies are the hands of heavenly instrumentalities, for heavenly angels employ human hands in practical ministry. Imagine that the angels are employing human hands in practical ministry. Their acts of unselfish ministry make them partakers in the success, which is a result of the relief offered. This is heaven's way of administering saving power. The knowledge and the actions of the heavenly order of workers, united with the knowledge and the power which are imparted to human agencies, relieves the oppressed and the distressed. The very angels who, when Satan was seeking the supremacy, fought the battle in the heavenly courts and triumphed on the side of God, the very angels from there, who from their exalted position shouted for joy over the creation of our world and over the creation of our first parents who were to inhabit the earth, the angels who witnessed the fall of man and his expulsion from his Eden home are most intensely interested to work in union with the fallen redeemed race in the development of that power which God gives to every man who will unite with heavenly intelligences to seek and save the human beings who are perishing in their sins. Can this be done without unity? Mm, evidently not. If men will become partakers of the divine nature and separate selfishness from their lives, special talents for helping one another will be granted them. If all will love as Christ has loved, that perishing men may be saved from ruin. Oh, what a change would come to our world. I will also leave in the midst of the unafflicted and a poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. The King of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion let not thy hands be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Zephaniah 3, 12 to 17. What a representation is this. Can we grasp its meaning? I was in a conversation this week with a sister that is heart sick over a situation that was going on within her church. Over these last couple of months, she was having to observe that great emphasis was being placed upon having a tree placed upon the platform of the church. decorated as the world would decorate it. That much was being said about the holiness 
of the season of the 25th of December. She was heart sick over the fact that so much was being paid in words to this symbol, yet the church itself was being divided. And that there were being those that were being asked to remove themselves from the church. God is ready to bless us. He is willing to bestow upon us gifts that we have no concept about. Yet we, are we currently in unity and are we ready to receive these gifts? I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Behold, at that time, I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that halteth, and gather her that was driven out. And I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. At that time, I will bring you again, even in the time that I gather you. For I will make you a name and a praise among the people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes saith the Lord, Zephaniah 3, 18 to 20. Read also the first chapter of Haggai. Okay, brothers and sisters, shall we now accept and look quickly at this that Mrs. White has stated that we need to read also the first chapter of Haggai. Is this now on your screen? Haggai for the first. Yes. Yeah. The time which Haggai prophesied is outlined in verse 1. Haggai reproveth the people's delay in building the temple. And in, he inciteth them to set about it. He's telling them to get busy. He promises them being forward of themselves of God's assistance. And the work is then set forward by the 14th verse. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, The people say, The time is not come the time that the Lord's house should be built. When we look at this historically, according again to tabled history that Brother Stephen so labored over so long to present for our, our admonition and our edification, this occurred on the 29th of August in the biblical year of 3526, 222 years after Isaiah 7-9. Now, depending on how we count this, we could have two symbols. One of the 65 years of the warning to Israel and to Judah, but also of 158, telling us not to enter into covenant with the nations around us. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, 
The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house shall be built. Is the Lord's house to be built today out of stone? Out of cut stone? Or is the Lord's house today to be built from living stones? I thought it was living stones. I agree. How can we build a house, a temple for the Lord, if the living stones are not in unity? Well, the structure would crumble. So obviously, you know, that unity is the answer to, it's like the cement that holds all the jewels together. But in the in the way that we are shown as as far as building, let's say, an altar, are we to have any mortar holding that altar together? No, I don't think so. It was uh, stone upon stone. Okay. <clears throat> this is the way we are to be in unity each stone fitting with another. Yeah, but also those stones weren't to be um, hewn. Those stones that were used in the temple or inside that uh, the wilderness uh, were unhewn stones. Right. For the temple. We also have unhewn stones for the altar. Right. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Set your heart on your ways. Consider what you are doing. Ye have sown much, and you bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, and you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. He that earneth wages earneth enough and puts it into a bag that is pierced through. What else do we see here? We are seeing a people that are not truly blessed. Nothing can do us real good without the blessing of God. What God blesses is blessed. Was not Jacob truly blessed by his father Isaac? Yeah. Was Abraham not truly blessed of God? Was he not uh, an example to all of those nations around him? You said not not blessed by God? Was he not truly blessed of God? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Therefore, a little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. Psalm 37, 16. The little with the blessing of God is more efficient, and it will extend farther. The grace of God will make a little go a great ways. When we devote ourselves to the affairs of the kingdom of God, he will mind our affairs. The word of God says of them who devoted their interests solely to their own affairs, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat but you have not enough. Ye drink, but you are not filled with drink. 
you clothe yourselves, but there is none that is warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. When God smiles upon our efforts, it is worth more than any earthly income. We need individually to understand our duties and our privileges. The things suffered and enjoyed are full of meaning. And if we will take heed to God's holy precepts, we shall prove in our character that we have known the things which make for our peace. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Psalm 119, 130. This expression, simple, does not mean those deficient in intellect, but those who have the simplicity of a child, willing to learn of its parents, teachable and obedient. They will discern the requisitions of divine truth, and their prayer will be, O Lord, do thou teach us how to learn of thee, that we may be wise in thy wisdom and happy in doing thy will in obedience and in love. The end of all things is at hand, and iniquity abounds because men have transgressed the law and broken the everlasting covenant given on condition of obedience and because of continual transgression. What is being referred to in this statement? Law of God. What else directly? Yeah. Oh, it was transgressed. The end of all things is at hand. Covenant. Covenant. And where, where do we find this covenant so very clearly delineated? Uh, oh, the, the, the Ten Commandments? Or is that what you're... Um... Do we not find a good explanation, a very good explanation of breaking the everlasting covenant that was given on condition of obedience and the continual transgression when we refer to Leviticus 26? Well, yeah. If we are here and wish to continue in continual transgressions, then we are accepting the continual curse. If we are willing to keep this everlasting covenant with God, and surrender to it and to that of the word, then we would be blessed and the world would say they are truly blessed. This is why I find it so very interesting that when Leviticus 26, with its blessings and curses, the seven times when this is being rejected, the ongoing curse is being accepted. For how can we keep the everlasting covenant that was given on a condition of obedience? if we are willing to set aside the warnings that were given. She continues, Isaiah 59, Ezekiel 20 verses 12 and 18, Amos 5, 11 through 20, Micah 6, 6 to 15, 
Haggai 1, 5 and 6, Hosea 6, 1 to 11, and 8, 12 to 13, Joel 1, 2 to 7, and 11 to 20. There we have the prophecies of the state of our world just prior to the second coming of the Lord thy God. The world will become more and more under the sway of seducing spirits as they turn away from God and his righteous government. Men professing godliness will indulge their own traits of character. Unless they are conscientiously under the control of God, they will become self-indulgent and self-centered. These passages are being denoted by Mrs. White as the prophecies of the state of our world just prior to the second coming of Christ. Brothers and sisters, when we conclude our meeting today, there will be sent out a document with all of these passages, all of the different verses that the translators use to support their understanding of the passages, all of the alternate readings, all of the variant Hebrew, There will be 22 pages of these passages. This will form your assignment for our meeting this next week. I would like to hear from each this next week what prophecies you see in these different passages. As we have already read, if we are not willing to study the prophecies, we will not come to know Christ. Each of these prophecies are showing us what will be happening in the world, that which we are to avoid. Each of these prophecies give us a clearer and clearer picture of that which we need from Christ our Savior. That we need by faith to understand. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. As in a letter written in 1897, dear brother Hare, I must speak to you, brother Haskell, brother Hughes, brother Wilson, and brother Daniels. How many brothers? Does she need to speak to here? Five. Yep. When we parted with you last evening, I said, we will not hasten the building of the meeting house, but last night has changed my ideas materially. I received instruction, which I cannot now put on paper fully. The instruction given me was to give to the people the words of the prophet. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord from the prophet, saying, It is time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, that this house lie waste. 
be left without attention, without coming into your calculation. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the mountain and bring wood and bring and build the house. And I will take pleasure in it. And I will be glorified, saith the Lord. The question was asked, shall the house of the Lord be left as the last consideration? Read this chapter of inspiration and take heed unto it. The first and the second chapters contain lessons for us. I received instruction to speak to the people and to tell them that we are not to leave the house of the Lord until the last consideration. There is no place of worship we can secure in which to assemble. In the cities, halls can be obtained, but the place in which we worship is becoming too small for us. This is not according to the will of God. Our first consideration should be to build a house for the Lord. As we've already discussed, we are to build that house for the Lord from living stone. The only way that this can be done is by the clear, simple explanation of the prophecies so that all may come to understand and see Christ as God has given him to us. Again, I was instructed that our place of worship should be of easy access and that the most precious portion of the land should be selected as a place which to build for God. The question was asked, have you shown proper respect for the master? Have you shown the eloquence of true politeness toward God? Consider here, have you shown the eloquence of true politeness toward God? When Christ was asked, what's the most important commandment? How did he respond? Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. And to love your brother as you would yourself. Correct. Something like that. How many times have we then shown this eloquence of the true politeness toward God. Because if we are treating our brothers and sisters as God himself would treat them, then are we choosing to speak ill of them or to cast them out? Well, that it wouldn't equate. Um... No, it doesn't. Can you rephrase that, Brother Dwight? Can you say that again? Are we not to treat our brothers as God himself would treat them? Are we not to look upon their situation as be requiring of us our compassion and our assistance to lift them up? For is this not what God would have us to do? Amen. He is the one from whom all your blessings flow. You have not any good thing but that which comes from God. You cannot worship God in a correct manner where you are now. You cannot now be you cannot bow before him in a suitable position. Build a house for God without delay. Secure the most favorable location. Prepare seats that will be proper for a house of God. Written 17th of August 1897. Published entirely in 13 manuscript releases, 355 to 358. 
He looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it, or blow it away. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. The last great day will reveal to them and to the whole universe what good might have been done had they not followed their selfish inclinations and thus robbed God in tithes and offerings. They might have placed their treasure in the bank of heaven and preserved it in bags that wax not old. But instead of this, they expended it upon themselves and their children and seemed to feel afraid that the Lord would get any of the money or of their influence. And thus they met with eternal loss. Let them contemplate the consequence of withholding from God. The slothful servant who put not out his Lord's money to usury loses an eternal inheritance in the kingdom of glory. The Lord says, return unto me and I will return unto you. Malachi 3, 7. Do not like the slothful servant ask, wherein shall I return? Wherein have I robbed thee? God has laid out the, tr the truth plain and clear before everyone who has embezzled his Lord's good. Look, God is in earnest with us. We make desperate efforts to accumulate money, and there may be flattering appearances of our success. But God says, I will blow upon it. I will scatter their substance as the wind scattereth the chaff. Haggai 1 9. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a draught upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. A striking illustration of the results of selfishly withholding even free will offerings from the cause of God was given in the days of the prophet Haggai. After their return from captivity in Babylon, the Jews undertook to rebuild the temple of the Lord, but meeting determined opposition from their enemies, they discontinued the work, and a severe draught by which they were reduced to actual want convinced them that it was impossible to complete the building of the temple. The time is not come, they said, <clears throat> the time that the Lord's house should be built. But a message was sent them by the Lord's prophet. Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, that this house lie waste? Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and you bring in little. You eat, but ye have not enough. You drink and ye are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves and there is no one that is warm. And he that earns wages, earns wages to put it in a bag with holes. He earns it and puts it into a bag that is pierced through. And then the reason is given. You looked for much and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste. And ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed with from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a draught upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon the labor of the hands. 
when one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the press fat for to draw out 50 vessels out of the press, there were but 20. I smote you with blessing and with mildew and with hail in all the labors of your hands. Haggai 2, 16 and 17. Roused by these warnings, the people set themselves to build the house of God. Then the word of the Lord came to them. Consider now from this day upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, from this day I will bless you. When the Lord's temple built of living stone is then completed and stands in unity before the world, then the Lord will bless Consider this for a moment. Says the wise man, there is that scattereth, yet increaseth, and there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but intendeth to poverty. Proverbs 11.24. And the same lesson is taught in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul. He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 8. God intended that his people Israel should be light bearers to all the people of the earth. In maintaining his public worship, they were bearing a testimony to the existence and sovereignty of the living God. And this worship, it was their privilege to sustain as an expression of their loyalty and their love to him. Are we any different today than were the people of the children of Israel at the time in which this was written? Yeah, I don't think so. Written for our admonition. admonition. The Lord has ordained that the diffusion of light and truth in the earth should be dependent upon the efforts and the offerings of those who are partakers of the heavenly gift. He might have made angels the ambassadors of his truth. He might have made, no, made known his will as he proclaimed the law from Sinai with his own voice. But in his infinite love and wisdom, he called men to become co-laborers with him by choosing them to do this work. We are being given an opportunity. to be united with other brothers and sisters, to being prepared to give a message that is going to lighten this earth with the glory of God, to lighten this whole earth with the glory of God. It's not for the accolades of man that this is done. It's not for the words of the world, for the approval of those. This is not some politically correct speech. This is a cutting speech. This is one that exposes sin. 
that goes right to the heart of the person. As Joshua said at the close of his life, choose ye this day who you will serve. This is the choice that is left to each of us this day. Any thoughts or questions with what we have been covering today? And if not thoughts or questions, are there any further comments? Then let us close with prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for these warnings. We thank you for the opportunity to understand the time in which we are living. We thank you for the opportunity that we have. that we may confess our sins to one that is faithful and just. That is offered his righteousness in place of our filthy rags. We ask now for your guidance, direct our steps through this day, direct our words, direct our thoughts, so that all may be done for your glory. Be with us now in all things. Show us that which we need to learn. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Mm -hmm.